I think you have had a brief introduction to chromatography. So you all know chromatography is a, basically a separation technique. So what is unique about chromatography? Chromatography has two phases. One is called a stationary phase and the other is called a mobile phase. So whichever type of chromatography, because you have a number of types um, available to you, whichever type you consider, you will see that there will be a stationary phase and there will be a mobile phase and the compounds that have to be separated will distribute between these two phases and that's how it will get separated. So one of the uh, conventional techniques is paper chromatography. See broadly if you classify chromatography you could say there are some techniques which are done in a column which is called the column chromatographic techniques and there are others which are done on plane surfaces flat surfaces so these are called the planar chromatographic techniques now among the planar chromatographic techniques you have two of them and one advanced technique too but the conventional techniques are two planar chromatographic techniques. One is paper chromatography, the other is thin layer chromatography, very commonly known as TLC. So definitely you have heard about these two techniques. The advanced technique is of course the high performance thin layer chromatography, which is also done on a plane surface. So today we start with the first of the planar techniques, classical technique, long back develop, and this is still being used to a great extent even today, after even a hundred years. This is considered to be the simplest, and that's why it is the most widely used of the conventional chromatographic techniques, because it can be used for different purposes. See, the main objective is separation, Separation for what purpose? We may separate to isolate a compound from a mixture. We may separate to identify the different compounds in a mixture, or we may even go for quantitative analysis. So quantitative analysis means finding out how much of each of the components is present in the mixture. So this could be done for both organic and inorganic compounds so far as paper chromatography is concerned. Now it is a technique that is carried out mainly by the flow of solvents on specially designed filter paper. Like you have already seen, chromatography has two components. One is a stationary phase and the other is the mobile phase. So in case of paper chromatography, both the stationary phase and the mobile phase are generally solvents or liquids. One is a liquid that is held on the surface or between the pores of cellulose fibers of the filter paper. And the other is what will be the mobile phase. So that is also a liquid. So you have two liquids. One which is stationary because it is held on the filter paper and the other which is moving over the stationary phase. Now this paper chromatography can actually be used in two modes. Primarily in two modes. One is paper partition chromatography. The other is paper adsorption chromatography. Paper partition chromatography has or utilizes moisture or water present in the pores of the cellulose fiber in the filter paper as the stationary phase. And a separate uh, solvent system is used as the mobile phase. This is the most commonly used technique of paper chromatography. Uh, like I said, the other mode is adsorption mode. So you have paper adsorption chromatography. Whenever you're talking about adsorption, it is always the separation between a solid and a liquid. So you have 
a solid as the stationary phase and the liquid as the mobile phase because mobile phase can be only either a liquid or gas because it has to flow over the stationary phase a solid will never be a mobile phase it should be mobile but a stationary phase will not be a gas it can be a solid or a liquid so in case of adsorption stationary phase is always a solid so paper here also paper is used as the support which is impregnated with silica or alumina these are adsorbents and they act as the stationary phase so the various components how do they separate based on their affinity towards the adsorbent how strongly they are adsorbed by the stationary phase that will decide how fast they move over the stationary phase along with the mobile phase coming to the principle of separation involved in paper chromatography it is generally partition and few times adsorption can also be used but we primarily say the principle of separation is partition that's because just like i told you now it is in the partition mode that it is more commonly used it's more convenient more easy to use it in the partition various com uh, compounds in a mixture are separated by their different distribution equilibria between water held on paper and the mobile phase solvent now here what which is the stationary phase it is water which is held on stationary phase uh, sorry on the support that is paper and mobile phase solvent can be a single solvent or a mixture of solvents which we will see subsequently in detail so we could say a method uh, of partition chromatography paper chromatography is a method of partition chromatography that uses filter paper strips as carrier or inert support it is just a support the paper is actually just a support it is neither the stationary phase nor the mobile phase now the factor governing the separation of mixtures of solutes on filter paper is the partition between the two immiscible phases since you are having two liquid phases the two should necessarily be immiscible with one another one of the phases that is stationary phase is usually water adsorbed on cellulose fibers in the paper the second is the organic solvent phase solvent which is uh, which flows past the sample on the paper that is the mobile phase so you have a representation of how the whole apparatus looks when the paper chromatographic experiment is proceeding so here you can see this is the paper this is your paper and these are the various compounds from your mixture which have got separated being colored you can observe them you also see the something labeled solvent this is nothing but the mobile phase you will not be able to see the stationary phase it is held on the surface of paper this mobile phase is going to travel up the paper carrying the various components which were present in the mixture and separating them so this is done in a chamber which is called the chromatographic chamber so partition occurs between the mobile phase and the stationary aqueous phase bound by the cellulose mobile phase is usually more organic uh, since the stationary phase is aqueous that is generally water the isolation depends on partition coefficient of the solution solute so this is how you will calculate uh, k equals the concentration in the stationary phase of the solute to the concentration in the mobile phase so it's a ratio of the two concentrations 
So now we come to the general procedure in paper chromatography. These are the various uh, steps that you need to uh, give importance to. First one being the choice of paper because it is the support material and it's an important part of paper chromatography from which this technique actually gets the name. So paper is important. Secondly, you have solvent. What are the different solvents used for what purposes? We will see that. Application of the sample. So the sample which has to be separated into its components has to be applied on paper. How is it done? That we will look into. Equilibration of paper is another step. Development. Next, detection. And finally, the identification of substances. These are the various steps. Now we go into each one of them and try to see in detail. First one being the choice of paper. Now the paper that is preferred to be used as a support is Wattman filter paper. This is the most commonly used filter paper in chromatography. You can use other types also, but the pore sizes should be very uniform. So this is just a picture of different shapes of Wattman filter paper that had available to you. You have circular ones, you have big sheets which can be cut, you have small uh, square sheets, you have rolled paper which can be made to stand in the mobile piece. But more importantly, the papers are categorized as fast papers, medium papers and slow papers. So what are these fast papers, medium papers and slow papers? Fast papers means where the mobile phase is able to go through the paper quite rapidly. Medium papers are the in-between papers, between the fast and slow, because the slow naturally means where the mobile phase actually travels very slowly through the paper. So medium will be at moderate rates. What, what makes a paper fast paper? If the pore sizes between the cellulose fibers are large, then the mobile phase can travel easily. If the pore sizes are very small, mobile phase travels slowly and that would comprise the slow papers. So it is a difference in the pore sizes of the papers. So based on that, they would be called fast, medium or slow papers. They are used for different purposes also. If you have a very simple separation, where you have only two components in your mixture and they are very different in their polarities, then you can go for fast paper because it's an easy separation. But if you have many components and they have similar polarities. They would be very difficult to separate. So you will have to go for slow papers. If you go for fast papers, you will get incomplete separations. So that is where the slow papers are used. Generally, since if you have no idea about the components in your mixture, the preferred paper is a medium paper and then Based on our separation, our results, we can go for fast or slow papers for the final analysis. Other types of papers are also available, like these are all the modified papers. For different purposes, we could use these. Modified papers like acid or base washed filter paper or even glass fiber type paper can be used. You also have the hydrophilic papers papers that can be modified by using various uh, chemicals like formamide, glycol, glycerol, etc. Hydrophobic papers also are there which are more hydrophobic in nature and they can also be used in uh, reverse phase chromatography. This is generally used uh, to hold non-polar 
solvents as the stationary things. Impregnation of paper with silica, alumina, or ion exchange raisins can also be done. So in that case, what would we be doing? We'll be doing paper adsorption chromatography, or we can even go for paper ion exchange chromatography which is a possibility, but ion exchange chromatography is generally preferably done in columns. Coming to the second step, what I had listed in the general procedure, choice of solvent. Now, polar solvents are more commonly employed as mobile bases, but the choice depends on the nature of the substances to be separated because light dissolves light. So you want separations to take place and then you want the components to be moved on the paper also so that each component gets fixed on the paper at different points, well separated from the next nearby component. If pure solvents do not give satisfactory separation, then a mixture of solvents of suitable polarity may be applied as the mobile phase. So what it means is you may have a single solvent. Say you have water, it has a different polarity. You have methanol, it has a different polarity. Now, if you want a mobile phase with an in-between polarity, then you can mix 50% of water with 50% of methanol to get the desired polarity. That's what I meant. In most cases, we do use mixture of solvents to get appropriate polarity. This is for the mobile phase. So you uh, can use pure solvents as mobile phase, buffer solutions, or mixture of solvents. So examples of hydrophilic mobile phases, isopropanol, ammonia water in the ratio 9 is to 12. You have methanol water in the ratio 4 is to 1. You have N-butanol, glacial acid acid and water in the ratio 4 is to 1 is to 5. There are many more. These are some simple ones which you can remember easily. You also have examples of hydro hydrophobic mobile phases, that is dimethyl ether cyclohexene mixture and kerosene 70% isopropanol mixture. Next is how do you prepare the paper? So you need to cut the paper, especially if you're taking sheets, which is the general practice, you need to cut the paper into desired shape and size depending on the work to be carried out. What type of development you're doing? What type of chamber you have? What is the size of the chamber? All that will decide what shape and size of paper is. Now, uh, as shown in this uh, picture here, you can see that it is a rectangular paper. So you will first draw the origin line. It is marked on this paper with an ordinary pencil, two centimeters from the bottom edge. So this is the bottom edge, and you will draw an origin line on this paper. It has to be done only with a pencil. No ink should be used because that will also create spots when you do the chromatography experiment. On the origin line, marks are made. See, you can see it here, marks are made two centimeters apart from each other. You can see the marks here. They are equidistant from one another. You should never make marks all crowded together. Say all the three marks within this space and nothing over here. That is not good because when the, the spots start rising, they may mix up with each other if they are very close. And that's the reason why two centimeter distance from between the spots is considered ideal. Next, you prepare the sample solution. Now, a solvent is also required to prepare the sample solution because 
pure solutions can be directly applied, but in most of the cases, we have mixtures which are solids and they need to be dissolved in a small amount of a suitable solvent. So, um, what type of solvent? What is a suitable solvent? A sol suitable solvent is one which can dissolve the entire sample. Now, you may have two solvents which, can, which are capable of dissolving your sample. Which would you prefer? You would prefer the one which is more volatile because the solvent used to make the sample solution should volatilize off fast from the paper after it has been applied. Its only purpose is to carry the substance onto the paper. Biological tissues are treated with suitable solvents and their extracts can be spotted on the paper. Application of the sample. How do you apply? The sample to be applied is dissolved in the mobile phase and applied you can dissolve in the mobile phase or you can dissolve in a suitable solvent like i just told you and applied as a small spot on the origin line using a capillary tube or a microwave uh, sorry a micro pipette you can also use a micro syringe you can see it in this picture very low concentration is preferably used to avoid large spots. We usually use low concentration solutions for spotting. Otherwise, the amount of the substance is in too uh, high a uh, value and therefore you will see a lot of spreading and large spots forming when it actually starts migrating on the paper. This, after application of the spot, the spot is dried on the filter paper and then the paper is placed in the development chamber as seen here. The chromatographic development chamber is made up of materials like glass, plastic or stainless steel. Of course, glass chambers are preferred the most is also transparent so you can see what type of separation is occurring inside they are available in various sizes so depending on your requirement you can take different sizes um, the chamber atmosphere should be saturated with solvent paper this is a requirement which must be done in order to get good separations, efficient separations. Otherwise, it leads to an error which is called the edge effect. This is because of unequal evaporations of the solvent from the paper as the solvent moves up the paper. So the chamber should be saturated with solvent paper. This is most commonly done by lining three sides of the chamber with filter paper, which is actually dipping into the solvent system at the bottom of the chamber. The three sides filter paper will get saturated and the, because the whole chamber is closed and airtight, it will also saturate the atmosphere inside the uh, chamber with the solvent vapors. Now coming to the next stage, that is development. The paper is dipped in solvent in such a manner that the spots will not dip into the solvent. This is a very important point. When you are placing the paper for development in the chamber, you have to ensure that it touches the mobile face. Then only the mobile face can be taken up and by capillarity action, it can move up the paper. However, the paper should be dipped in such a way that the spots you have applied on the paper should never be dipped into the mobile face. The solvent is then allowed to rise up 
that is development proceeds and this is a lot continue till about two thirds of the paper height is covered this is for good results so now we come to another important uh, aspect of paper chromatography that is the different types of development yeah basically paper is actually a very flexible uh, entity so you can have different types of development you have five types the first being ascending development the next four being descending a combination of ascending descending then you have radial or circular and lastly you have two dimensional development so, so we start with the ascending development here the solvent flows against gravity because it moves up so from bottom the solvent travels up as shown in this picture the spots are placed at the bottom of the paper and kept in a chamber with the mobile phase at the bottom so you have the mobile phase at the bottom and the paper is suspended into the mobile phase the spots are on the lower side of the paper so as the paper gets wet by the mobile phase then it reaches the spots and then it carries the various components in the spots as it travels up the paper. Since there is an upward traveling, it is called ascending development. Next, you have the descending development. Here, the solvent holder is at the top. You need special equipment here because you need the solvent to be placed at the top and hence you need a holder the spots are placed at the top of the paper here as shown here and the mobile phase flows down the paper so wherever the mobile phase comes into contact with the paper the spot should be towards that end so in case of descending the top part of the paper comes into contact with the mobile phase which is placed in a holder at the top of the chamber so the spots are also on the top and the spots will then travel down you also see a serrated edge uh, for the paper this is generally done because in case this uh, solvent system reaches the edge of the paper then it will conveniently drop down we see here the advantage descending development has an advantage it is a very fast development so it can be used only for simple separations where you have less number of components and easily separated components for such you can use it there is one more uh, advantage if the solvent moves beyond the end of the paper that means in this case bottom end then you can still analyze your chromatogram you may still be able to identify the components quantify them isolate them but if you see in case of ascending development since it is the top part of the uh, paper here uh, the top part um, suppose the solvent rises to the top end where will it go if you have left the paper in the solvent after that it can only flow down it cannot go up beyond the paper so if it starts flowing down it is going to carry the separated components again in the reverse direction that will ensure complete mixing of separated components so in case of ascending development if the paper has been completely wet by the mobile phase then it is better to discard that chromatogram and redo the experiment but this advantage you have in descending because it will not interfere with your chromatogram at all even if the solvent goes beyond the edge of the paper 
The third one is ascending, descending development. This is actually a hybrid of the upper two techniques. You can see here that you have a solvent in one of these drops. The other will be empty. Uh, so you have the solvent moving up the paper first and then coming down the paper. So it is always first ascending and then followed by descending. What is the advantage of this technique? The advantage is you are increasing the length of the paper. See, there is a limitation for the length of paper that can be used because one important requirement of any chromatographic technique is you need to maintain the rate of flow of mobile paste constant throughout your chromatographic technique. So, if you have a paper that is more than 20 centimeters, it would be difficult to maintain constant flow rate of mobile paste. And that is why the limitation for paper size is 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. So if your separation is a very difficult one and it requires a longer length to be traversed than more than 20 centimeters, you can go for ascending, descending them. You can have 20 centimeters in the ascending uh, mode and 20 centimeters in the descending mode. So you have two different techniques taking place. So since descending is a faster one, as the first separated components enters the descending mode, it moves very fast and easily gets separated from the next component, which is still in ascending mode and therefore traveling very slowly. This helps in complex mixture separation. The fourth type of development is the circular or radial development. Here spot is kept at the center of the paper. You can see here, it may be in the center or you can have just like you had the origin line in the ascending and descending type. Here you can have an origin circle drawn with a pencil and on this you can spot your uh, uh, samples or standards and samples so that can be done on the circle at equidistant positions so you can have one two three if you have three if you have four one two three four spottings so three could be standards one could be sample or you can have three different, four different samples if they all need the same mobile piece. Generally for the radial development, we prefer using a circular paper because it is done in a Petri dish. So Petri dishes are circular and therefore we use a paper that is also circular in shape. So we keep it, say this is your Petri dish, it has solvent in it, not till the brim, a little lower. And then you keep the paper on top of the Petri dish. Of course, the, the diameter of the paper should be more than that of the Petri dish so that it stays on top only and doesn't go inside. Now you need a connection between the solvent and the paper which is on top. And that can be done either with a strip of filter paper, which acts as a wick, or you can use a cotton wick, which touches the paper on one side and the solvent on the other side. So something which can carry the solvent from here to the paper. So this is your circular paper so each spot height could be say about uh, 0.5 centimeter so whereas here they will be spread out in a semicircular zone so the same spot if you pull it across then its width will or sorry the height will reduce and therefore you can have more number of samples separated here within a small distance. 
that is the advantage of radiant fast technique and also uh, economical because it saves on solvent cost. And lastly, you have the two dimensional development. This is a multi development technique because development is done twice. In this method, the paper is developed in one direction and then followed by a second development, which is done in a direction that is at right angles to the first development. So you need to rotate the paper 90 degrees before the second development can be carried out. In the second development, a different mobile phase can be used. This helps in much better separation. Here there is one more unique feature. The sample is not applied on origin line. Only one sample can be applied at a time and it will be applied at one corner. Say as shown in this picture, you can see the sample being applied on the paper at the right side bottom corner. Now this is the first development. B indicates the first development where it is ascending development. So from here, different components are getting separated, but you can see that they are not completely separated. They are partially separated. You can see the mixtures here. So they are partially separated. Now next to what you do is you rotate it 90 degrees. You have to rotate it clockwise because you have to ensure that these spots come at the bottom end since you are going for the same ascending type. If you rotate it anti-clockwise, then these are going to be at the top and the solvent is moving up. So there is no question of separating it. That's why it's important that you rotate 90 degrees and clockwise. If you had originally made the spot on the left side, then you would have rotated anti-clockwise. Okay, so here you have rotated it clockwise and a different solvent is used. Again, you start the development and this time you will see, see here, blue and yellow were mixed up. Now blue and yellow are totally separated. Pink and red were mixed up. Now they are separated. These were already separate. They are still separated. So ultimately you got all the six uh, sorry, this is the original spotting. All the five spots separate. Here we have one, two, three after the first development. This is the advantage of going for two dimensional paper chromatic. And these were the different types of development techniques. That is, we uh, had five techniques ascending descending, combination of ascending, descending, and then you have radial and two dimension. What is the next step after development? After development, you need to uh, remove the paper from the chamber and you have to dry the paper. This has to be done fast in order to avoid spreading of the spots. If the spots spread, then there are high chances that the one spot will mix up with the next adjacent spot because each spot is becoming larger. And this will happen because of diffusion in the liquids which are there on the paper. You have a liquid stationary phase and you have a liquid mobile phase. So that can lead to problems in your separation. So before you dry it, however, you have to mark the solvent front with a pencil. So before drying the chromatogram, you have to mark the solvent front with a pencil. You can dry it uh, by different means. You can keep it in a uh, hot air oven uh, at, of course, not very high temperature because paper may char. Or you can also dry it with a hair dryer, but this gives uneven drying. You can, it is generally adopted. Next, you need to detect uh, the spots and for which visualizing agents are used. If the substances are colored, then they can be visualized and uh, detected easily. But if you have colorless substances, then physical or chemical methods are used to detect the spots. 
So you have physical methods, which are the non-specific methods. You have iodine chamber method. So you can have uh, various organic compounds uh, detected by this method, or you can even place your paper in a UV chamber for fluorescent compounds. Because when you place in the UV chamber, if the compound is fluorescent, then you can see light being emitted. Um, that is, fluorescence can be used to detect the spots, the presence of the spots, and then you can make a mark of the spot. More commonly used are the chemical methods because these are the specific methods, and this is usually done by the spraying method. So you can have different uh, reagents used for various types of compounds. You can have the uh, you can have ferric chloride for phenolic compounds and tannins. Ferric, ferric chloride gives a violet color with phenolic compounds. Ninhydrin in acetone is another very commonly used visualizing reagent. This is used for uh, detection of amino acids where you get the purple spots. You can have dragon dwarfs reagent for alkaloids with orange spots, or you can even have three pi dinitrobenzoic acid for the cardiac glycosides. Coming to the quantitative estimations, we have two uh, types of techniques the direct technique and the indirect te techniques. Direct techniques. You can have any of these comparison of visual spots. That means you have a standard spot and you have your sample spot also. You know the standard concentration and you don't know the concentration of the sample. You visually look, see both the spots and depending upon the colors of the two, you can say, your sample has the same concentration, lesser concentration, or more concentration than your standard spot. It is a very uh, preliminary way of doing it. It is semi-quantitative method, you could say. Then you have densitometry where you can, um, this is a pick of that. So here, what you can do is uh, basically find the density of the spot color. So based on the intensity of the color, it will uh, give you a reading for the concentration. It will compare the standard whose concentration is known with the intensity of uh, with a given intensity of color and the sample whose intensity of color will be recorded and hence its concentration can be calculated. You can also go for fluorimetry, what I just mentioned, observing under the UV uh lamp uh, in a uv chamber you can have the radio tracer methods for radioactive compounds like a gigamula the counter can be used you can also have polarographic and conductometric methods so where it is these are the direct methods the indirect methods are more commonly used. It's very simple to do it because since we are dealing with paper, once you visualize the spots, you can cut those spots and uh, the spots, can, the compound that is fixed as a spot on the paper can be extracted with a suitable solvent. Once you get a solution, you can analyze that solution by any quantitative analytical technique like spectrophotometry, electrochemical methods, etc. Now we come for qualitative analysis, that is identification. So here we have different migration parameters which we use for identification. The first one most commonly used is RF value. RF is the distance from the start to the center of the spot, as shown in this pic, and divided by the distance from the start, that is the origin line, to the solvent front, which you have drawn after you took the paper out. So this ratio will help you to identify. If you get a correct match with your standard, then you identify positively a given spot of sample. RF values, however, depend on a number of factors, primarily on the temperature um, that is there and also the solvent that we have used. Uh, so it, it would be more effective to identify a compound 
uh, is to spot both the known substance that is the standard uh, solution uh, as well as the unknown substance on the same paper or plate. Um, if you do that, then all these uh, variables can be accounted for and you can compare the RF values. If you get an exact match, then definitely you can identify the sample spot. In addition, the purity of a sample may be estimated from the chromatogram. Because when you do it and you are, if you are getting only a single sample uh, spot after chromatography, that means that the sample, only that compound is present in solution. It is highly pure. If any impurities are present, then more spots will be obtained. Whereas a pure sample will show only one spot. Factors affecting RF value. The temperature, the purity of the solvents used, quality of paper, means which grade you have used, adsorbents in, and impurities present in adsorbents. If you're going for paper adsorption chromatography, then chamber saturation techniques, have you saturated or not, that will affect the RF value. Is it incomplete separation, saturation or complete saturation? Method of drying, how you are dried? Is it fast drying, slow drying? All that will uh, result in differences in RF value. What development you have undertaken, ascending, descending, different types, that will affect the RF value. Distance traveled by solute and solvent. Uh, say one person allows uh, development to take uh, place over six centimeters another allows it to take place over 12 centimeters then the rf value for the same substance will be different for both the anal uh, analysis that has been done uh, chemical reaction between substances being partitioned if there is any chemical reaction definitely it will affect the rf value because a reaction always results in a new substance and the ph of the mobile while phase also can cause changes in RF value because it will affect the migration. Sometimes if you cannot find uh, the RF value, that is you do not have a solvent front. When that happens, when the solvent moves beyond the end of the paper and it is a descending technique, we can still identify. I mentioned it earlier, that is, you can do it by calculating the Rx value. If the solvent runs off the end of the paper, Rx value can be used. What is Rx value? It's the ratio of distance traveled by sample to the distance traveled by standard. Now we finally come to the applications of paper chromatography. It can be used for separation of mixture of drugs, you can use it for separation of carbohydrates, vitamins, antibiotics, proteins, etc. You can also use it for identification of drugs, identification of impurities present in different samples, and you can also use for analysis of metabolites of drugs in body fluids like blood, urine, etc. So a lot of applications. For the applications, you need also to uh, have some specific applications like, say, uh, if you are saying uh, it can be used for separation of uh, amino acids, then uh, you should know what is the stationary phase used for amino acid. One example, one mobile phase and what is the detection reagent. Like this, you should collect a few specific examples also for applications. So that completes 